Send in the red shirts. Hey everyone, it's me, Q Storm. I'm back to review the last episode of Star Trek Discovery. Now, if it sounds like I, <laughs> if it sounds like I just had a, a mild stroke, not to worry. I just got back from the dentist's office, and the whole side of my cheek or jaw is numb. So, apologies. Just bear with me. It's I, I, I'm almost as numb as I was when I watched last Thursday's episode, but I'm not going to start off bitching and complaining because actually I, I, I want to surprise you. I actually enjoyed the first, what, five minutes of this episode. You know why? Because we got introduced to Michael Burnham's family. We got introduced to the mom, the dad, and young Michael Burnham, and they were written as human beings, three-dimensional human beings. I actually felt something when I saw these guys on screen, the three of them. I thought the casting of the mother was perfect. I could see her being Michael Burnham's mother physically. And the actress is a fantastic actress. At least she was in this scene. We'll get into that a little bit later. Everything was believable. The family reminded me of the family in a Voyager episode where we meet Seven of Nine's parents. And Seven's a little, uh, Seven of Nine at the time was a little girl and her family is foolishly researching the Borg and you know how that ended up. It, it almost had that same amount of pathos because these people were three-dimensional and they were written well. But the more I saw of Michael's mom, I don't remember the actress's name, ah, uh, it's like the less I liked her and it was like, wow, I see why I'm, I see where Michael Burnham gets her unlikability. How did they say? She get it from a mama. I mean, the more we saw of her, the less I liked her. She seemed just as overly dramatic and just overwrought as Michael always seems to be. Um, now, granted, these are some weird circumstances, tragic circumstances. I get it. But still, this is Star Trek and you sign on. You sign on to the unknown, to the impossible when you join Starfleet or you are involved with anything having to do with the with Starfleet, particularly Section 31. Michael, granted, she has an emotional reunion with her mother, uh, but she spends most of this episode looking distraught, crying, weeping, screaming, emotional. And she was raised on Vulcan, right? She's emotional. And it's like, you know, you 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 are still a Starfleet officer. You've been trained to be a Starfleet officer. So all these displays of emotion, given that you're a Starfleet officer and given that you were raised on Vulcan, it just doesn't, it's annoying at this point. When they first meet Michael and mom, it's like mom has an attitude right off the bat. And I, I tried to read that as, well, she wasn't willing to let Michael in because she knew she had to leave her again. She didn't want to establish that emotional bond because it would be all the more devastating when she had to leave because she's of the mind that she has to go back in time or back to the future. But still, I don't know. It just, I don't know. It just didn't, it rang hollow to me. I didn't buy any of it. It was just seemed like a, it seemed like a black box theater, overly dramatic, uh, ensemble play or something like a one act play. Well what have worked for me is if uh the mom is wakened up in in on the on the uh, outpost and rather than establishing that she immediately is gonna be drawn back through the wormhole I didn't know wormholes work that way by the way but instead of establishing that she's gonna be immediately drawn back through the wormhole with the suit maybe um there's a time frame, maybe she has 24 hours before the wormhole opens up. That way we have time, or the writers would have time to have her beam up to Discovery and have some heartfelt moments where we can invest in her as a character. So, uh, think about like, um, I can't remember the name of the episode, but uh, TNG, where uh, Data is reunited with uh, Noonien Sung's wife, who is technically his mother. And they have this bonding. It's, it's a really beautiful episode where they bond together. And I don't want to reveal what happens in case you haven't seen it, although it's been I don't know how many years. 
But there have been tons of moments like that in, in good Star Trek. Uh, Jordy and his mom, when they reunite. Enterprise, where Travis, the one episode where they gave Travis a lot to do, Travis Mayweather reunites with his family, or at least his brother, if I'm not mistaken. That was a great episode. The point being is that, why not structure it where we get to learn about this character? They, they're just so, they just want to move past everything. They just wanna, it's all about the action, and they, they give us these little scenes where we're supposed to feel something, like the scene between Michael and Mom, and it just comes off as flat. And, you know, what's interesting is that it seems like, why does the wormhole know when the containment field drops and the wormhole then appears? Given what they've written here, it seems like the wormhole should be above the whole time trying to suck her in. But it only appears when the containment field is dropped. That doesn't make any sense. And once again, we get the Michael Burnham is the center of the universe line with mom saying, I've been fighting for you, Michael. So to add to the tally, I've been fighting for you, Michael. The variants are all about you, Michael. It's all, it's, uh, that's what Spock says to her. Arium says, uh, it's all about you, Michael. It's all about you, Michael. And uh, Giorgio says something about, uh, I know all about you, Michael. It's always about Michael. Make her the captain of the ship, for God's sake. Because, again, in this episode, Pike is once again standing around twiddling his thumbs. There's a scene where uh, where Colber, on a view screen, uh, he, he tells Captain Pike, and Michael's in the background, he tells Captain Pike that uh, uh, Burnham, Mom Burnham has awakened and she wants to speak to you, Captain. And Michael says, okay, we're on our way. No, that's not how it works, sweetheart. Uh-uh. The captain determines who's going where. And then he just turns around and looks at her like, oh, really? Oh, okay. And then the next scene is they have a meeting in his ready room. And Michael's sitting there like with an attitude to the captain saying, oh, it's my mother. I must go. I must go. Look, damn it. You're a Starfleet officer first. Okay? You're a Starfleet officer. Act like one, for God's sake. What is all this emotion coming from her? I gave her a pass in season one in the very first episode where she uh, starts the mutiny. And I, my reasoning was that you have a woman who is a human being with emotions, natural emotions, that are, that are normal, and she was raised on Vulcan, where she was, I assume, taught to suppress her emotions. So when she gets into that situation with the Battle of the Binary Stars, I think that's what it was called, she has a moment of PTSD, let's say, and the Klingons attack, and this is a woman who suppressed her emotions. Uh, her, her gender has nothing to do with it, but she su suppressed her emotions all this time because her family was killed by the Klingons, at least at that point in that episode, the, the, the pilot episode, that's what she's, that's what she thinks. So she strikes back and I, you know, everyone was complaining, oh, she committed a mutiny. Uh, my fellow red shirt, big sexy, he gets on me all the time. She shouldn't be, she, that's, she should have been expelled completely. And I gave her a pass because, you know, I, I liked that. That was a character moment to me. A woman who has to suppress her emotions in a, in a society that is not natural to her because she's a human being made of emotions. But she hasn't grown. She has not grown at all since the first season. As a matter of fact, she's gotten worse. I wouldn't have her on my crew. But let me get back on track. I had moved into how Pike has become a non-entity once again on his own ship. Well, it's not really his ship. It's his ship temporarily. But um, there was a moment where Pike gave a command about, um, I forget what it was, but then Spock overrides him and says, oh, Captain, there's no time for that. I'm doing this. Suck it up. <laughs> like, Pike, dude. Ah. Speaking of Spock, I guess we learn on this episode that Spock has been dyslexic all this time. Spock is dyslexic now. I wonder what else they're going to throw into that. I also have a question about Michael Mom. Something she says to Giorgio. She says, she says to Giorgio, uh, Philippa. Can we have a conversation mother to mother? And did I miss something? Is Philippa Giorgio a mom? I don't recall that. Maybe I have to look, look at uh, season one again. And I'm assuming that that Michael mom is is of the of the uh, impression 
that this Philippa is the prime universe Philippa, not the Terran universe, because I don't assume that her her suit would have allowed her to go back in time into the Terran universe. Maybe the Terran Giorgio was a mother. I didn't get that sense, and I don't. I didn't. I don't remember it being uh, revealed that she's a mom in the prime universe before she was killed, unless. She's referring to Philippa's attachment to Michael, in which case she is talking about Philippa Giorgio from the Prime Universe. And even if she is, to say, let's have a conversation mother to mother based on that relationship that Giorgio as a starship captain has with, uh, with Michael, that seems like an odd thing for a mom to say, talking about her own daughter. So, I don't know. Someone help me out with that, please. And now we move into the real the real issue with this episode. If this is not intended to be an introduction of the Borg, then these writers really are kind of cribbing their asses off. Because when I first saw it, I didn't realize... I, I mean, I, I guess my mind wasn't willing to accept that they could be doing that. And I didn't even think about Borg. I just thought about, you know, AI ha invading a human being. And, I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, things like uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture where V'ger, you know, kind of uh, gets into the, the humans, uh, Decker and uh, Ilea. You know, we've seen countless number of times other consciousness... Con yeah, it's, it's the it's the no the Novocaine. We've seen plenty of times other consciousness consciousnesses <laughs> invade crew members. You know, there was the episode Power Play on TNG. Um, you know, the the paw wraiths in DS Nine. Uh, so it's not an uncommon thing for a sentience to invade a human being or another character. And I just read it like that. But then I was speaking to the guys over at Midnight's Edge, and uh, they were like, "This is." They, they were suggesting that this might be the Borg. And I saw a video, uh, a YouTube video. I'll try to find it and post it and post the link in the notes, where someone did a almost like a scene by scene. They took every scene with Leland. And juxtaposed it with a scene involving the Borg, and they made a convincing argument. You see the tubules go into the guy's neck, just like you saw the tubules go into, uh, in First Contact, there's a shot where the Borg um, injects tubules into a crewman's neck. It's the guy who, if you remember in First Contact, he says, Captain, help me! And cold-ass Picard shoots him. <laughs> it's that guy, if you, if you remember that scene. It was a brilliant video. So I'm like, if they are doing that with the Borg, if they're trying to suggest that this AI that was created by Control is the nascent Borg, you know what, man? I, 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 I'm definitely going to have to let it go. I'm really going to have to let it go. Because, I mean, how, how else do you explain the veins that come out in his face and Although he had the black eyes, that, that's not Borg-like. But how do you explain the veins and everything? Uh, and how do you explain his ability to be have super strength when he's fighting Giorgio uh, uh, and his reflexes and everything? And he gets, uh, I know he gets, he takes phaser shots directly to the chest, to the center mass with no injury. It seemed like the human portion of him would be injured if nothing else. I've heard a lot of people say, no, it's not Borg. And I don't want to think it is because the Borg were on the other side of the galaxy. I mean, of course, a lot of things can happen from this time period to when TNG crops up. And, you know, the fact that they're changing the timeline and they're doing away with canon anyway, they could rewrite all the rules. So, you know, shame on you guys. Shame on the writers if you're introducing the Borg into this into this timeline. A couple things didn't make sense to me that I'm hoping someone out there can explain. Um, what I have a note here, Leland tells Giorgio to, con to contact him once she places all those little discs that are intended to steal the information uh, from the sphere that the crew is trying to download into the suit and then send the suit 
past the point of 950 years or something so that AI can't find it or the control can't find it. I don't know why they don't just put it into a, a thumb drive or a hard drive or whatever and just smash the damn thing. You know, that's just me. Uh, or w whatever the equivalent of a hard drive is in the 23rd century. So we get Leland giving Jojo that command. Contact me once you've placed all of the discs. So what do we see? Jojo beams down. She places all the discs. And she starts, well, she places all the discs. And we see her have a conversation with the mom. And we cut from there to Leland back on the uh, Section 31 ship. And he's immediately downloading the data from the discs. How did he know to start doing that? Because Giorgio never contacted him. But that's a nitpick. That's just sloppy. That's good. You know, that's the least amount of sloppy writing from these guys, from this, from this staff. I would also ask, why did Giorgio agree to set the discs to steal the information? And then once she does that, she decides all of a sudden that Leland needs to be monitored because she says to uh, Ash, after she set the discs and after the discs have gathered all the information, then she contacts Ash using a comm badge. Interesting. I thought those weren't developed until TNG. Anyway, she contacts Ash and she says, let's see what Leland does in the dark or something like that. So now all of a sudden she's become suspicious of Leland. What turned her to become suspicious of Leland all of a sudden? Now, my wife suggested that it was something that it was something that the mom, that mom Burnham said, which was a callback to something that Leland himself said. And I can't remember what the line was, it has something to do with, I don't know, some kind of skullduggery or something. I can't remember the line. And I wasn't about to queue up Discovery and go through all the commercials since I paid for the commercials. Uh, I'm not going to pay any more than I have to for CBS All Access. But there was, a, there was a line that both of them said that my wife uh, supposed that when, when Giorgio heard Mom Burnham say it, it tipped her off that it might have been Leland that she got the line from. I don't, you know. And it was a line that would have made her suspicious that Leland is up to no good. I, you know, I, I don't know. It seems a little flimsy to me. Another thing I didn't really understand that was kind of sloppy to me is that everyone on Discovery has to get Pike's permission to beam down to the outpost where Mom Burnham is. Even though Section 31, I assume, is not under the auspices of Pike, it would seem to me that when Stamets and Burnham are down there setting up the repeaters, or uh, the pattern repeaters or whatever they are. Philippa, Giorgio, beams in. And they all know she's with Section 31, but they don't question her at all what she's doing there. They kind of just walk off and that allows her to set the discs and go talk to uh, Mom Burnham. That's, that's convenient writing, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, a woman that we don't trust, who we all seem to know now that she is a uh, Terran, She's all of a sudden beaming down and she's going to go talk to Mommy Burnham. We're not going to have any questions about that, are we? Yeah, that does that makes total sense. And then there's the wormhole. I kind of went into uh, detail about that. It doesn't make any sense that the wormhole appears after the containment field is dropped. I don't know what it is about this containment field that the wormhole says, eh, I'm not even going to try to suck her back until they drop that damn field. You know, like I said, it should have been over her the whole time. But anyway, this wormhole is able to suck up the suit. And then shortly after it sucks up her, that just makes no sense to me either. Why? It seems like to me when she's out of the suit, it shouldn't be an issue. But somehow the suit is tied to her. She says to Burnham, the suit is DNA sensitive to me only. So you shouldn't try to steal it. How did that happen? When did that happen? Just because she, what is it? The suit imprints on whoever puts it on the first time? And was that the first time she'd ever worn the suit and when she puts it on in the beginning? It's just these, these conveniences that just drive me nuts with these writers. And so she goes, the, the wormhole has suction. Interesting. And it sucks her back. She's not wearing any type of protective layers or anything like that. Seems like she would be dead immediately. 
but I'm sure she's okay. I'm sure she's okay. Because the writers need her to be. And so what happens after that? The one time where I could see Burnham being completely shaken, emotionally drained or crying. Uh, we see her playing a game of chess with Spock. And she's smiling. Okay. All right. So, all right. I don't really have a lot on this episode. It didn't do much for me except for the first five to ten minutes. I really love that. I... I almost wish the whole episode had been a flashback episode because it, then I would have gotten some humanity in at least one episode this season. And next episode, we've, we're going back to the to the Klingons. Ah, oh, God. And that damn baby. I don't care about that baby. I don't care about Ash. I don't care about Laurel. And clearly the writers don't care either because why, why bring them back? If you guys are doing a serialized method of storytelling... You've already got your story. We, we, we've, you give, there's enough on the table now for you to deal with instead of bringing the Klingons back in. Okay, folks, that's it for this review. Uh, like I say, I apologize if, if, I, if, if it was hard to understand what I was saying at points. Like I said, the whole side of the, my face is numb because I, I just came from the dentist. And I got to tell you, when he put that needle into my gum, I let the expletives fly. Now, I got to head out because I'm being honored at a dinner by Mel Torme. And if you're a Seinfeld fan, that just made sense to you. Hopefully you're laughing. Okay, I'll check you out later this week. Yeah.